Hello, I'm Lucy Neve. I'm I'm just here to introduce the poets here today, but I just want to start by acknowledging that we're on Ngunnawal and Nambri country. It's unceded land. Unceded, I guess, is a very polite way of saying stolen, uh, for which there was never a treaty. And if you're on one of the upper floors of this building, I believe you can also see Narago country, but I'm happy to be corrected on that if I've got that wrong. I want to acknowledge the long custodianship of this land on the part of First Nations people, the long tradition of telling stories, of teaching and learning, and the long tradition of deep listening. I pay my respects to ancestors past and present who cared for country and are the custodians of stories, and I'm welcoming of all First Nations people here today. So I'm just going to introduce Ellen Van Nieven and Elfie Shiasaki. And then they're going to read their poetry and have a conversation about poetry and poetics. There aren't going to be any questions, just so you know, but there will be a book signing afterwards so you can go and purchase their books and also um, they'll, they'll sign them for you. So Ellen Van Nieven is this year's H.C. Coombs Fellow in the School of Literature, Languages and Linguistics in the Research School of the Humanities and Creative Arts. They are an award-winning author, editor and educator of the Mananjali <laughs> Language Group and Dutch Heritage. The most recent book is um, Personal Score. It's a fantastic, fascinating book. And I'm, I'm sort of surprised that Ellie hasn't been assaulted by a whole lot of people like me who had very bad experiences of playing sport um, for various reasons. I mean, Ellen didn't, but I'll let Ellen talk about that if, if they're going to. Um, and they've also won several awards for poetry. Their first poetry collection, Comfort Food, won the Tim, Tina Kane Emergent Award and shortlisted for the New South Wales Premier's Literary Awards. Kenneth's surprise. And we're very lucky to have Elfie Shiyasaki, yeah. a Nunga and Yamaru writer, Yawaru writer, as well as an associate professor at the College of Arts and Social Sciences at the Australian National University. Elfie's research and teaching explores Indigenous desires for human rights and self determination. And she's also the winner, the writer of an award winning collection of poetry called Homecoming. So thank you so much for coming and speaking. Um, and in light of events near and far, which continue to reverberate, especially, I think, for First Nations people, I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to listen to the poetry and conversation between Ellen and Elton. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you, Lucy, for kicking us off. Um, I think I'll add my own acknowledgement of being on this country, um, where I've been for the last six weeks on Manawa and Nambri country and pay my deepest respects to the traditional owners and elders of this place, as well as also acknowledging other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people present today. It's a real privilege for me to be here on Ngunnawal Nambri country, which is, has been my home for the past year, and to be invited to the Sea Lights School of Literature to be speaking to you today and to share the stage with you. I think it's um, <clears throat> a lovely thing to do. Yeah, I think I was only here for very like 24 hours when I got a really welcoming text by you, Elfie, um, um, inviting me to have a feed. And so having your like friendship while I've been here has been really good and also just such a fan of your poetry, <laughs> which I'm really glad that we can just sort of share this space together and, and we're going to be reading um some some poems that have been published and some newer work as well um, which we'll tell you a little bit more about soon so what we're doing today is <clears throat> alan and i are just having a conversation as if it's just the two of us and um, we're sharing some of our, our works old and new and we are both fans of each other so we're <laughs> fan over each other's yeah. reading yeah. and um I think there are a lot of uh, connections too between um, the themes that we're working on. Shall we start, Ellen, by inviting you to share with the group uh, about your fellowship at the ANU? It's been such, um, <clears throat> it's been so um, nourishing actually to have your presence here on the campus here on the Nambri country and to have you being a part of the ANU community and we will mourn at the end of your fellowship. Um, but would you like to share with us what brought you 
here to learn more of their yeah, country. Absolutely. Um I really have to thank everyone involved in making it possible for me to be here. But the real the emphasis was you know, Lucy Need was a big part of it. Um giving me some time and space to research and to write. Um, and so the particular project that um that you know I've been working on um is in is in, in its very early stages. Um, but this was a great match to be here while the project's in the early stages to have, you know, access to so much um, material and, and also just so many people to to talk to. Um, and that project is really, I'm not going to read from it today because it's still, it's still being shaped and formed. So I'm still figuring out what it's going, what the form is going to be. Um, so, and what, what are the you know the ethics even even around sort of telling that story, but it it does sort of center around um, the border of this is specific um, part of the border of Queensland and New South Wales. Um, that's I have ancestral ties to, um, and so it's really thinking about thinking that through what that 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 border is actually meant for. Um, both for the land and for the people and 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 sort of how to sort of speak back and sort of play with with ideas of like indigenous geographies and stuff like that. So and doing it through poetry. Um, so yeah, just looking at a lot of like material and, and maps and but also pairing that with like the stories from back home. Mm -hmm. um, so it's gonna really, enter another stage when I get to go home and be back in country. Um, so yeah, just like feeling like there's been so much, so much things that have informed where I am, like through being here and um, getting, getting, um, you know, getting, finding my way around and, and making friends and, and it's been so much, it's big part, I think that the relationships can be a big part of, um, sustaining um, a, a creative practice which is otherwise can be quite lonely and isolating um, and then there's been a you know I've been working on some other things while I've been here as well that have just really felt like it's like kind of the last few weeks I just finished a like a children's book manuscript mm -hmm. and then um there was some newer poems that I was playing around with as well. So it's a whole thing of like doing three projects at once where you think, actually, wouldn't it be better if you just focus on one? But it's like, no, actually, they're all at different stages and that sort of keeps mm -hmm. things moving. Things are speaking to me at a particular moment. So mm -hmm. it's been good. It's There's still so much to, to go, but I'm really, um, yeah, really been enjoying it. Yeah. Wonderful. It's lovely to think that. <clears throat> Further down your journey, you might come to see that you've carried some pieces of not all in every country home with you, some knowledge, stories, and friendships, and they will be kind of a part of your future writing projects. Absolutely. They make meaning of that time you have here when you get home. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, we're very lucky to have had you here with us. <clears throat> Shall we do some reading? Yeah. So. We thought um, that we'll read from like uh, most uh, recently published poetry collections first. So I'm going to read from Throat, which was published in 2020. And Elfie is going to read from Homecoming 2021 Magabala, which is just an incredible collection that I really encourage everyone to, to read if you haven't read already. I'm really looking forward to hearing from that. But so I think first I'm going to read from Throat. Just going to read like three poems from Throat. Um, it's the book with the pink cover um, that I ended up just printing out the poems to read instead of reading from the book. But um, I decided, I sort of um, asked a few of my friends if there were any particular poems that they would like me to read as part of Throat. And so they selected two poems and I've chosen another one myself. Um, and the first poem is 
called um, All That Is Loved Can Be Saved. And um, I guess in the spirit of friendship as well, I actually um, dedicated this poem to a friend of mine called um, Norman Erickson Pasaribu, um, who's a really amazing um, Indonesian poet, um, a queer Bantab writer um, who lives in Bali. And um, yeah, Norman and I first met um, in the Philippines on a residency. And we, you know, I think uh, in some ways it's been, I think I wanted to choose poems today that are poems that um, it's sort of about like reaching out and like hugging people. I, I'm not going to do that to you guys, don't worry. <laughs> but through like words, I guess the idea of um, that's how I'm just feeling um, at the moment about wanting to to be nourished and wanting to nourish other people. So um, all that is loved can be saved. You might find language is inside you, shiny and speckled like a rock that wants someone to sit on it. You might find instead of an empty silence, your ears filled with wind and sound. Birds hold conversations thousands of years old. Your loves love your ancient thoughts. They have come to you. It could be a house. It could be the wrinkles in the hands of a man who knows your grandfather. It could be a rain cloud above an equally promising body of water. When you speak, you are in listening. When you dream, you are in dreaming. Close your eyes and fill the space. What is it saying? It could be what you do when you are broken. It could be what you do when you are safe. You might find language is inside you, shiny and speckled, a rock. The body labors under memory. My tongue hurts from all the things I have said, all the things I haven't. Ways of feeling invisible require proper planning. All the spit in the world, in this pool, especially mine. And the last poem I'm going to read from Throat is called Queens. Um, it's another poem that's dedicated to someone, this person being uh, Candy Royale, um, who I, I met just once um, on Aranda Country in Central Desert, um, but was so happy to have met Candy um, and just what a presence she was um, in the Australian poetry scene. Um, she was a Lebanese Palestinian Australian queer poet and spoken word performer. And um, sadly, she passed away um, at the age of 37. Um, and she was just an incredible, incredible um, uh, just performer and just energy. And uh, you couldn't just help but be inspired by um by her and her her fierceness and and uh, I saw a whole generation of poets be inspired by her work. Um, so this is called Queens. Read my terms and conditions. 
we all carry wars within us. There was a time when I was into perfection. I was outside myself. The spiritual work didn't get done. I learned to fear fear. I buried mountains. I didn't know that I was just beginning. And all of our stories are really about finding a connection that will help with the pain. And we all lead back to rivers and flow into seas. And we breathe with our mothers and heartbeat with our grandmothers. Despite what is against us, we make excellent choices and are deserving of the fullest and warmest love. This is the time of night where we can ask ourselves, how much would we do without fear? Thank you so much for your work. Um, so beautifully, and I think what um, I felt was that sense of um, kind of restorative love that is woven into throat, and I think that's what I enjoy so much about reading that collection. It's something to return to when you need that restoration, I think, in the spirit. So it's such a um, kind of gift or an offering to us that you have created that work for us. Can you share with us <clears throat> what throat represents to you in terms of your evolution as a writer? What does it represent in terms of where you had come from and where you were going? Yeah, thanks so much, Elfie. Um, so throat was the like my third book um, and second book of poetry. Um, and so, like I mentioned earlier, it was published in 2020, but, you know, it was probably about five years of writing. Um, and really the idea came from, um, you know, reading a lot of works and being around a lot of people that made me feel really safe and warm mm -hmm. um, and wanting to write about, um, yeah, write, you know, write against um, fear or, or, you know, the sort of, self-censoring or just you know anything that sort of pushes us it makes us feel like we don't have a voice um we don't have a say we can't speak up and sort of put all those feelings and 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 uh thoughts into creating a, a body of work that was actually quite diverse in in the sort of forms that I'm working with in that collection um more so than um comfort food which was very much a, like a, a work that really was very, in some ways very specific to Southeast Queensland and also some of the um, travels that I did along the way, but sort of thinking about some of the, the really um, incredible poets that I was influenced by that, that come from that country. Um, throat was meaning, leaning a little bit more, some of the poems are a little bit more visual and, and also just um, reflect sort of the the movements of my life, like moving, living two years in, in Nam in Wurundjeri country and spending six months in Germany. And um, so there's different, it, sometimes they kind of feel like, you know, you read back and you think, oh, you know, that's mm -hmm. that's little, you know, younger me, you know, and that's mm -hmm. the sort of journey that, that I was on, but still the journey that I'm on today. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, and there's also um, some passages in the book that I worked with my cousin, Sean Davis, on um, that have been translated into even better. So, wow. um, yeah, so, yeah, that work being poetry book number two mm -hmm. and being very specific time reflects the influences yep. in, in my world at that time, yeah. And how did it feel for that experience of like reclaiming voice <laughs> mm, yeah I think um like it's something I don't often talk about but I think you know it can 
go right back to childhood. And so for like the large periods of when I was younger, I was like selectively mute because I was like really influenced by um, people being really sort of horrible to me when I was younger, like my peers based mainly. And so I would only speak to people that I trusted or fam like close family members for like a really long time. And so um all of the all of my ex expression was going into like written work. Um and so I think yeah it's also, it's really it's really interesting when there's such a sort of um when you know there's so many people that feel that they don't have a say um, mm. and they, they can't be who they are fully mm. um, in certain spaces. And I sort of wanted to write in some ways to that experience and to, to younger people or other people that might have had that experience where they feel like that they mm. can't be fully themselves um, and especially being, you know, in a place that's so oppressive and, and many of us mm. do grow up in really oppressive places for a number of different reasons. Um, yeah, so I think that I'm really glad that that book has like found its readership, I guess, in that yeah. way. Yeah. And it has that emphasis on speaking, but I do, mm -hmm. one of the areas that I enjoy researching in Indigenous studies is mm -hmm. the ethics of listening. And mm -hmm. we, we often understand the ethics that we're practicing when we're speaking but there is that ethic that the person who is listening is also practicing and part of that is being um <clears throat> participating in that space and creating a cultural safe space so that someone can speak mm. um truthfully from their lived experience and i think that's it's a really important um discussion to have that we're all actually mm. as a group actively practicing our ethics in this space as we are some of us are speaking but also listening and, and we really value mm. um, ethical listening so people that listen with respect absolutely that's yeah, yeah. really really great point about it mm. um, would you feel like you would like to to read okay. homecoming yes i had one more question for you but I okay can't no, you can ask it i've been really wanting to ask it because i did hear you read um the body language and the memory yeah later, and there's an exquisite line about all the things i haven't said mm. and I wanted to ask you about uh, um, as a writer and poet where do those words go the ones that you decide to make unsaid yeah that's such a good question maybe yeah. there's no answer that's like, such a good question um I think sometimes they're in the body um I think sometimes they're in what we expend um in other ways um you know sometimes Sometimes things don't have words. Sometimes feelings yes. don't have words as well, yeah. um, or at least uh, we we can't find the right register for. So I think you know there's always a you know a balancing act that we play where we choose what we share with the people around us, where we should choose what we share in the public sphere, and what we choose what what we actually decide to put into print. Um, and that could be for a range of different reasons. But what about yourself? Mm -hmm. I think I don't know the answer to the question I asked you, <laughs> but um, I do agree with you that mm. words that perhaps um, we can't yet find to say mm. or are too hard to say, I think they do go into the body. Yeah. And um, I have learned in my own practice how um, healing it is to to speak. Mm. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. And sometimes it's only for myself but other times it finds a way into um mm. book and it is a big part of your um journey as a writer as a, as a human I think to to um express mm. <clears throat> what you're thinking and how you're feeling mm. okay do you, you like to read yeah I yes. love you too. I'm very humbled to be reading in front of Ellen and I'm going to read from her coming yeah which was published by Magabala Books in 2021. And uh, it's a book that I wrote about four generations of Wajakan women, Noongar women in my family, women from 
Can you speak up? <clears throat> yes, I can. I feel like I am shouting, but I do know I have a very quiet voice and I'm just recovering from bronchitis, so I'll do my best to yell at you all. <laughs> but um, do we have a, a mic? Do we have a mic? Okay, well, now I'm going mic? to boom. Yes, I'm going to boom at you. You want one too, Ellen, maybe? Just... <clears throat> Thank you. How does that sound? Okay. Uh, the collective sigh of relief really <laughs> from the room that they know to leave in so closely. Thank you, Catherine, for letting me know that. <clears throat> so, homecoming is uh, the story of the ancestors that came before me, and it has a particular focus on um, love within our families and. It is a record of unending love, that love is not ruptured when children are removed from their parents as part of the stolen generation. Um, <clears throat> and it came from a five-year research project where the Noongar community opened the government archives in Western Australia and we searched for letters that Noongar people had written that were relevant in archives. And my role in that research was to look at letters that Noongar mums and dads had written to the government after their children were removed, mm -hmm. and there were hundreds of them, mm -hmm. and um, to reconnect these letters to living descendants. So there were some startling moments in this project where we would meet with elder um, nanas and pops in our community and return a letter to them and they did not know that their mum or dad had written that letter to them. So it was a very um, emotional but also healing project mm -hmm. for the Noongar community. And <clears throat> as a shock, some of those letters were from my own family connected to my great grandmother, Olive Harris, who was removed from her family as a child. And so the book kind of attempts to I'm over explaining. No, no, but, no, 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 no. Okay. Well, but, but feel free to read. Yeah, just read. Okay. <laughs> but that's very yeah. useful information yes. so, for us to insert ourselves into that. that. Yeah. So it is a fragments of archival records. Mm -hmm. So the section I'm going to read to you today is fragmented. So the first is from my great grandmother Olive's father Edward, who wrote letters to A.O. Neville, the Chief Protector of Aborigines in Western Australia for around a decade mm -hmm. when his four children were taken from him. So Edward Neville's letter to A.O. Neville, 29 March 1990. I can never convince myself you are anxious for me to have my children back. I have told you before that you are hostile and biased. I still believe you are the same. In all my dealings with you, read the children, you have raised too many obstacles, created too many difficulties. The result to me has always been disappointment. I have carried out all the conditions you have imposed on me. I expect you to fulfill your promises. Rain will come. The dry of the wheat belt rose from the horizon. Chalky layers of pastel yellows, oranges and pinks uprooting the heat from the earth. Pull on track towards the river with the other girls, away from the cool shade of the salmon gums. They sang gentle Jesus in chorus with the full body, watching over them like they were soft grey feathered chicks. The water pulled around imprints of pull on small feet along the river bank, forming silty clouds in the sand the river shimmered in admiration of the children, treasuring the gift of their Sunday afternoon fellowship and the stolen times they stopped by on their way home from school. Pulan waded out into the river and dipped her head under the water, ritually cleansing herself of heat, sweat and dust. She drew a deep breath and wriggling her toes into the river sand, dove into the deepest form of the water. Its coolness kissed her sunburned cheeks. Woolen closed her eyes and dreamed of the river in, made herself a dusk offering. 
the sunlight of tomorrow will warm the surface of the water, make her molecules speed up and move so rapidly that tightly packed and vibrating against each other, she will escape into vapour, leaving behind the salt from the tributary. Suspended in air, rising high into the atmosphere, she will cool down again and condense. Returning to water, she will gather to form clouds and precipitation, drifting over the darling ranges toward the Indian Ocean. She will then fall from the clouds, out of the afternoon sky, in droplets of rain filled with rays of sunlight and a million rainbows, returning colour to her mother's vision, the place she belongs to. <coughs> Reborn. If I could take you from that place, I would. If I could hold you in my arms, I would. Reborn as mine. Comfort you always, just as your own mother would too. And the last one is a letter from Edward Harris to the Deputy Chief Protectors of Aborigines on the 29th of March in 1920. I have applied to Mr Neville more times than I should have. Each time he has refused my request. Several times I have asked him on what grounds does he refuse to restore my children to me. I am still in the dark. Of course I will apply it again for my children, also ask for an inquiry. The way I have been treated by that gentleman is an outrage to one's feeling and affection. His inclinations to thwart me in this matter have been successful thus far. All time conditions and other matters prevented me having my case tried so far, but I'm still going to go on. Hope for justice in the finish. <laughs> Thank you, Alfie. First time that I, I, I had the pleasure to witness you read from that beautiful work, and um, the, the poems themselves are, you know, heartbreaking, harrowing, aching. Um, there's such a gentleness in the way that you write and read. Um, how do you feel about that book today? I think after I finished writing Homecoming, I really unburdened myself of it and put it down for a few years and I've only recently returned to it and picked it up. And so um, it, it's a great privilege to have been able to honour my grandmothers and grandfathers in the way that the book does and a great sense of poetic justice that their voices have been honoured in this time. Um, because they were so dishonoured um, in their generation. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel very uh, privileged to have done it, but it took a lot out of me. Mm -hmm. And I actually only rarely have the energy to return home. Mm -hmm. And I, I enjoy to return to it in spaces like this that feel safe where you and I are yelling about it, but it's, uh, it has been a lot to carry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so spaces that where you feel you have that that control over, you know, entering. Yeah, it's just a compassionate space yeah. Yeah, yeah, where yeah. the history is known and shared. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Is it your turn to read? Um, I th I think so. Yeah. Um, Is it going to read some new work? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think I'm going to read um, some new works. Um, and, uh, yeah, they're really works that I um, uh, wanted to, um, yeah, I think I'm, like, looking at what that, you know, new collection will be, and, and that's separate from the archival project, but just, having, you know, poems sort of laying around and, and being 
having really periods of feeling like I'm enjoying the process of writing poems again. Um, I think I'm going to read um, this poem first, which is, doesn't really have a title at the moment, um, uh, but it's, you know, it fits into the, my theme of, of today of wanting to, to, uh, to read poems that are sort of centered around like love. Um, uh, so it's uncaring and, and sort of really both for the self but for others as well. So land between grandmother mountain and river mouth in deep black soil. Latch onto Goombara trees planted by the old people. Laugh with the wet winds. Leave behind love letter baskets. Lead us to the queerness of country. Leak fresh water. Leap like a fish. Learn language slowly and in the right time. Leather compassion over cold shoulders. Lend blood to the poisoned river. Lick the lips of risk. Lift the weights of elders' shoulders. Light the dark wells of shame in young people's eyes. Lay down and rest around the new generation of poet warriors. Like being country's soft butch. Link up to queers across oceans. List our demands daily. Listen to the insects. Live in the old forest. Lock away the keys to government access to our sacred wetlands. Long for new friendships that transcend expectations. Look for the parts of our history that weren't written down by settlers. Love yarns by fire and kisses by water. Lubricate the rigid boundaries of state lines and colonial gender enforcement. Lull in the scent of lemon and tea tree. Illuminate the way like moonshine as we fit into our ancestors' steps. And this last poem, um, which is called a poem for protection. What comes first, the poem or the poet? Which remains longer on country? Poem, please protect me from greed. Danger occurs when I crave the singular. Hiding in the crackle of the present, crave the sandalwood behind the neck. In the quiet corners of a room behind the ears of hugs. Quiet. The earth moves so greatly when I want to run. Remain originated by soul, move, scoot, nothing. While we still have hours, souls to the beat block of wind. 
I am a living line. I am a living line. I stay in the light, in the light. I stay in the light, in the light. Thank you. Thank you so much for another beautiful reading. And what really struck me and calls me to the, that collection of poems is how comfortably um, two things sit side by side together. One, where in the poems you are on country and country is restoring you and nurturing you. And the other is those acts of resistance and worryship. And I think we have discussed this at times when you've been out, while you've been here at the ANU, that kind of intermingling of joy and grief mm -hmm. and how important it is to give expression to the fact that we, we don't often have one without the other. Mm. Yeah, I think it did it come from when we were sort of um, thinking about this event and we were saying, you know, it's in some ways it's a celebration, but because, you know, there's been so much over the last few weeks, there's, it's not fully a celebration to be together at this time and how it's, I think, you know, that's, um, yeah, there's sort of, it's like a kind of a false binary to imagine that, you know, we're always going to be in grieving, always going to be in joy when there's, you know, there's so much overlap um, all the time that's ever present um, in the way that we live and in the way that we write and what we choose to sort of honor. Um, so yeah, I really sort of thank you for making that observation. Um, and then how do you sort of balance that in, in your own work or do you not necessarily see it as, a, as something you need to balance? The question that I asked and I don't know the answer to again. Um, I think I just let my mind be at ease and accept that the two coexist together. Mm -hmm. So rather than struggle to expel the grief, to embrace the joy, I accept that they sit side by side mm -hmm. together and that that's okay. Mm -hmm. And at some of the most joyous times, the grief can be very present. Mm -hmm. At some of the most difficult times, the joy can, can be present. So it is, yeah. It's a, it's a great thing in that way, yeah. Does this kind of um, delightful uplifting in your new works, does that signal a future direction of your writing? Good is question. Um, well, I deliberately, there's a lot of, you know, heavy poems that I've written over the last year or so that I just, I, you know, when you make a selection for a reading, sometimes you don't feel like going into to that work or doesn't feel like the right place. It feels like well, maybe if I'm back home or, you know, have, you know, um, the, for a particular occasion, some poems feel more easily read. So, but in terms of um, thinking about the new direction of where my work is headed, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm still figuring it out, but I know that, um, again, I have a whole, you know, there's a whole bunch of new things that have, that have been influencing me and, and also in the way that um, I'm wanting to write. And and um, I think, um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see and and uh, we'll see what where it, it, it gets to and, and, and where it sort of feels like it, it, it fits in terms of the trajectory of the work. But it's like what we were saying earlier as well, you know, that um, it's not... Not necessarily like a like a line from A to B. Sometimes we sort of circle over, you know, older territory and older themes that have always been in our work. Um, and you know, in in sort of segueing to to thinking about you and your work, um, we have some exciting news. Both a, a new publication today, but also one next year. Would you like to talk? Yes. Um, well, it's very exciting this week. West Philly Magazine, which is based at UWA in Perth, is publishing a collection of poetry that I've edited for them in an online special issue. 
And so I think that's that today, but there are a few hours before we go. So <laughs> I'm still waiting on that. But it's um comes from my times so against Great at Perth Writers Festival earlier in the year, where we commissioned poetry from West Australian poets to explore the theme gender, which is the normal language where it starts. And we interpreted that theme as that which is eternal, unchanging. Um, we really interpreted it as truth telling. And so it's a lovely collection of poetry that you can access free online, hopefully later today. And uh, it contains some beautiful work, including by my auntie, um, okay. Yamaji poet, Charmaine okay. Pepper, um, Green. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's lovely. And I do have a new collection coming out in 2024 in the middle of the year, which is called Refugia, which explores the um, looming bicentenary of the Swan River colony in Western Australia, which is in 2029. So it is a look about what could have been that mm -hmm. history. It's not inevitable that colonisation came from choices that individual people made mm -hmm. and um, how we might as a community reckon with those decisions. Mm -hmm. In 2029. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want me to read everyone else? No, no, no. I, I am keeping time, okay. keeping Western time, and we still have <laughs> um, 10 ish minutes. So this is a real treat for me to hear your new work. Um, sort of like, is it sort of this? It's yeah. kind of a debuting of, of this new work that will be out next year. Yeah. You are my test audience. So mm -hmm. it's always a little nerve wracking reading work that you haven't read to anyone other than your mum or, yeah. or Alan just before. Um, so it, the poems I've chosen for you are um, reflections on nationhood in Western Australia. Fatherhood, the reflections on the concept that is still prevalent in West Australia that our state was founded by Captain James Sterling, who arrived in West Australia in 1827 and again in 1829 to take possession of Western Australia, which is described in the West Australian Act of 1829 as, quote, wild and unoccupied lands. And um, the poems I've chosen, there is a bit. Um, Prickly. My fathers. Colonial weeds in the soil of memory proclaim that the founding father of Western Australia is Captain James Sterling. Planting feet and flag on ancestral lands of the Wajapunga without fatherly love in the vessels of his heart and making an offering of pistols and swords swathed in the Union Jack to gods of greed. Yet retrograde amnesia blooms in the mind, corroding and pitting truths into flaky and brittle knowledge. I am not the daughter of Captain Sterling, my father's father Wajak, born from a country where the river calves apart, from mountain to sea, where the sun rises over the Darwin ranges and falls into the Indian Ocean. We are in the mournful bird song of the Black Cock 2, blocking before rain. We are in the full moon dragging sea onto land and scattering seaweed and blue bonnets. We are in the first glint of light crowning mountains with golden eastward sky. We are in gusts of the southerly carrying smoke haze from bushfires north. A millennia old nation overlaid by another. Stories buried yet beating under layers of rock, soil, and debris. Land and sky meet as feet stamp soil into clouds of dust, dance on Mungabuja to hear her speak. Listen. An oceanic journey on HMS success to Nongal Buja in 1827, navigating stars rising and setting in constellation between Sydney, Hobart, King George Sound, Cape Lewin, Rottnest Island, Captain James Sterling and Nissen in between the beating breeze and squalls when you pass through the gust front 
of the thunderstorm and the wind drops and the tide slackens and the surface of the water reflects the curvature of the earth and the moon is half crescent and starlight bathes you and your skin soaks in their eternal luminosity and the stars dip and float in the water and you see them below and not above. Could you not hear the stars singing out to you, teaching you to build your campfire on the shores of the Indian Ocean and in fire and smoke anticipate the water, to welcome you, to ensure your safe passage, to exchange knowledge and stories, to be curious and friendly, to be cared for by Nuala Buja until you return home to your own country with your belly full and peace in your heart. Thank you. Um, this new work is very visual, very staunch, and also very generous in that offering of, of you know, there was there's another way, you know, there was another way. Um, and you described it as prickly. Um, Prickly to whom and what is the prickle? What's what? How did it sort of feel um, writing this this work and and yeah, where are the prickles? Well, I I left the prickly ones in the manuscript. I didn't read them mm. as much today, but um, I think I think I was probably. I'm not sure how to answer that question. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, it's a very good question. I think it's almost yeah. hard to articulate mm -hmm. new work. I think um I think it's potentially more of a wrecking mm -hmm. than yeah. prickly work because mm -hmm. it's really asking my own community in Western Australia to look at um the knowledge that does exist mm -hmm. in the colony's own archives and in the one people's own spoken word histories about how violent the genesis of the Swan River colony was. And that is a frequently conversation for West Australians. Um, and it's asking the reader to consider more truthful language around invasion and um, genocide. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's not, in my experience, a comfortable conversation for many Australians, mm. but it is one that we are starting to have. And I think the work, the new work, holds this tension of being both gentle and um, um, it's like surgical as well. Yes. At the same time. Yeah. 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 So awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Um, um, no doubt it will be very important, you know, for, for people in Western Australia to read, but also. Um, uh, uh, sort of to ripple effect across the continent. Um, so, yeah, so really looking forward to, to mid 2024. Thank you. Um, is there anything else you want to say before we wrap things up? Um, the only thing I would say is that it's just been absolutely lovely having this young view, and thank you again for. Um, your friendship while you've been here at the ANU and for having this yarn with me and to thank Lucy for inviting us to be here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted, wanted to firstly say thank you, Elfie and, and Lucy, and just, you know, all the people who have been, who've been kind to me while I've been here and um, and just everyone who's come today to, to listen to us and have share a feed with us. Um, Thank you so much, and and yeah, really looking forward to the the rest of my stay. Um, so yeah, thanks so much.